the governor's mansion to the state house and senate to congressional seats there is no doubt that tennessee is just about as red as red gets but believe it or not that wasn't always the case between 1992 to 1994 and then again from 2003 to 2004 democrats actually enjoyed a trifecta where they controlled the governor's mansion and the full state legislature but for the last 11 years the grand old party has just controlled all three. The Tennessee Democratic Party made history, though, earlier this year when it elected Hendrel Remus as its first black chairman. The Memphis native has stepped into the role and is working to change the politics in a state that he unequivocally believes can actually nudge to the left. And here to tell us how he plans to do just that is the man himself, Hendro, welcome so much, I should say, uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. to Amplified. Appreciate having you here, and I want to congratulate you not only for being elected, but certainly for, for making history and being the first black person to step into this role is not an easy feat by any stretch of the imagination. So looking forward to see what you do with the Texas Democratic Party, and I would love for you to share with us a little bit about your agenda. What are you hoping to get done as the head of the party there? Well, thank you. Thank you, Aisha, for the invitation and, and, and thank you for the congratulatory uh, thanks. Well, we've got a we've got a lot of work to do here in Tennessee, uh, but I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic. I think you mentioned uh, uh, in that introduction uh, the fact that Democrats uh, are no uh, stranger to having power here in Tennessee. Actually, uh, from Reconstruction up until 2010, uh, Democrats controlled the state legislature in our gubernatorial races. That pendulum swung every eight years, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can get back to where we uh, need to be, but we've got a whole lot of work. Uh, I think the party uh, started off on a good foot. Uh, it, it began to really embrace this big tent uh, ideology that we have uh, by electing the first African-American chair. Um, obviously, it took a, a while for that to happen, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud that I'm here. And uh, the goal for us is to make sure that uh, we are hitting reset in a way that's going to allow us to uh, deliver our message to voters across uh, the state in every corner, uh, regardless of them being far left or far right or or more conservative or moderate Democrats. Uh, we are going to make sure that we shore up uh, the support that we need to, in order to begin to break uh, into the super uh, majority and give Democrats a fighting chance here in Tennessee again. Mm. Now, I want to talk about that Big Ten umbrella that you just outlined. You you personally are reflective of the Big Ten. You've been open about the fact that you come from humble beginnings. You're the fourth of eight children. And obviously, you happen to be a black man also living in the South. I wonder how you're going to use your role to amplify the Tennesseans who uh, may have been marginalized or, or left behind, and also how to meet people where they are, because you just outlined a pretty disparate a uh, sense of Democrats, right? The Democrats, they're all over the map in ideology and, and race and otherwise. Yeah, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great point. I think one of the things that we've seen early signs of as we uh, attempt to test uh, a more populist message across the state, I use my own life as an example when I'm in rural parts of the state that have traditionally been uh, more Republican. Uh, you mentioned uh, me being the fourth of eight children. My mom uh, never graduated from high school. She had the Herculean task of making sure that all eight of her children graduated from high school and either went to college or joined the military and then made sure that we got back out into society and began this process of giving back and being engaged civically. So when I go to parts of the state uh, that are in tatters, uh, because Republicans have driven certain communities off of the economic cliff, I'm able to tell my story in a way that resonates with uh, voters all across the state. Uh, because what we've learned is that despite what part of the state we live in, what race we are, so many of the issues that we face have these commonalities. 
Now, the biggest goal has been trying to break through this culture war that Republicans have been uh, waging all across the country. Mm -hmm. But here in Tennessee, uh, particularly, we've decided to take it head on. And I think uh, it's it's hard uh, to have an African-American standing in front of a, a, a room that's predominantly white in rural parts of the state. And I'm saying, hey, I get it. I understand. I look different. I'm from a different place. But uh, but I face some of the same struggles that you faced. I've lived through some of the same situations you've lived through. My friends, family, coworkers, and classmates have also gone through some of the same things. But here's how we get to a better place, and here's a party that can help to deliver that for us. I'm glad that you brought up the culture wars because, you know, as you outlined, Tennessee at one point was a Democratic stronghold, but it's actually shifted. And it's now very much Republican territory since uh, 2011 or so. And I'm curious what factors actually led to that um, that shift. The, the culture wars are interesting because when you talk about them, I instantly see those rural white voters who might have at some point voted Democrat becoming Republicans, and I'm curious as to why. So what are you finding out there about you know wh what those factors were that led the Democrats to kind of start to lose out, and then how do you get them back? Yeah, it's been it's been very interesting, and, and uh, everybody has their own ideas about about how we got here and, and why so many uh, rural white voters um, uh, left the party. Uh, uh, and a lot of it goes back to President Obama being elected and uh, seeing that mass exit of Democrats in Tennessee to the Republican Party. But it's been quite interesting because the ideas and a lot of the policies and legislative agendas that they've had over the last 11 years have absolutely been chaotic and reckless. Um, so it has been more in alignment with, you know, people being afraid that somehow there's a threat to the, the way of life, uh, a threat to the values. Uh, many people here, you know, are, are deeply rooted in uh, evangelical politics. Uh, so the, the threat that somehow there's a threat to that culture or that reality, I think uh, has scared a lot of people off, uh, but I think, you know, from Democrats and from a Democratic perspective here in Tennessee, I don't think that we've done a, a great enough job at really understanding our electorate instead of uh, instead of really defining uh, who we are in a way that encompasses a, a message that embraces everyone and involves everyone. We have really uh, ran head first into the social arguments, the social fights on a lot of the social issues instead of, uh, again, drawing the commonalities between each other. Yeah, so I, I love that you're running directly into those, you know, headfirst into those issues. We know that Democrats were extremely successful in Georgia last year and flipped the state. And so I wonder now, as leader of the Democratic Party, also in a southern state, you are going headfirst into those uh, progressive issues. What notes did you take from Georgia's political playbook, and how is that informing your strategy? Well, number one, we've got to make sure that uh, that we're looking out and, and, and cultivating the African-American vote uh, in places like Memphis and Nashville, where we have a, uh, a huge Democratic population or bigger share of the electorate. We've got to make sure that we're turning black voters out. Uh, we got to make sure that we're running more black candidates for public office. But at the same time, uh, we've got to make sure that we're organizing in a way that's going to be able to mobilize people. Uh, Tennessee happened to be at the bottom in voter participation in the country. So we've got a whole lot of vote that's still left out there to get. We've got to make sure that we're registering more people and then turning them out during early voting and during Election Day. So our goals and our focus for 2022 is going to be to make sure that we're organizing, organizing, organizing and organizing some more, because that's been one of the things that uh, that, that has really uh, bogged us down as a state party. And I believe that if we if we focus on mo mobilizing uh, our, our our base uh, voters and then uh, focus on turning out a surge vote, uh, we'll be we'll be successful. Now, I'm under no impression that we're going to turn Tennessee blue overnight. I know that it's going to take uh, it's mm -hmm. going to take some time, mm -hmm. and it's going to take us working towards a a, a long term plan that really uh, can produce results. And redistricting is not going to make that a whole lot better for us. Uh, here in Tennessee next year, but we're going to keep uh, pressing forward. 
because we've seen ma major population loss in a lot of rural parts of our states. And we have places like Nashville that are booming and growing almost daily. So we got to take advantage of the opportunities that we have. And then we've just, we've just got to be patient because obviously it's going to take us a, a, a little longer than what we'd like. Hendrell Remus, first black man to chair the Tennessee Democratic Party, clearly a man with a plan. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your vision with us. We'll keep watching the state and have you back here on Amplify to chat about it.